respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who are joining us on the line today. Um, I'm coming to you from beautiful Gadigal country of the Eora Nation, but just acknowledging that wherever we are, we are on Aboriginal land, which was never ceded. It's lovely to have you all with us today and thank you for joining. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into the session. I wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded. Um, I'd ask for you all to remain on mute and your video off unless you are speaking so that you can see the presenters um, and we should all be appearing on your screen. Um, if you do have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to pop those into the chat box. We will have time for Q&A later on in the session, and we're really excited to hear from you and to address some of those questions then. It's lovely to have you all joining us today. My name is Melissa Coltner. I'm an EY-based human services evaluator, and I coordinate EY's evaluation practice network alongside wearing another hat for the Australian Evaluation Society in the New South Wales Organising Committee. And I'm really excited to be chairing the session today, which is an AES session focused on cross-jurisdictional approaches to guiding program evaluation and features a range of great guest speakers from across Australia. If you're an evaluator as I am, you'll be conscious of the way that evaluation frameworks shape, shape our thinking as evaluators and guide our choices in methodologies and the approaches to the way that we deliver evaluation. The conversation that we'll have today will review approaches and frameworks across jurisdictions and delve into some of the similarities and differences in approaches between different areas. We're really excited to be sharing this conversation with you all today. I'd like to introduce you to today's panel. We have Danielle Spurt. Danielle is Principal Economist and Evaluation Lead at the Centre of Evidence and Evaluation in New South Wales Treasury. And she works to strengthen the quality of evidence and support government decision making. Danielle's previously led development and evaluation of evaluation strategies in both New South Wales and Northern Territory and developed and delivered courses in University of Sydney and New South, University of New South Wales related to socioeconomic development, regional and remote area development and environmental management. Welcome Danielle. We also have Todd, Todd Sandness, who's joining us from Queensland has more than 20 years experience in working in state and Australian government departments with quanti leading quantitative and qualitative research, program evaluation and performance management. As Assistant Government Statistician in the Queensland Government Statistician's Office in Queensland Treasury, his team is responsible for the Queensland Government Program Evaluation Guidelines and the collection of a large range of official statistics on behalf of the Queensland Government. Welcome Todd. We have Eleanor joining us today, Eleanor Williams, who has recently joined the Australian and New Zealand School of Government as Deputy Director of Research and Advisory. Prior to this, Eleanor held a large number of roles across um, various Victorian government departments, including health, primary and cabinet, and education and training. And most recently, Eleanor led the Centre for Evaluation and Research Evidence at the Department of Health. Welcome, Eleanor. We have Christabel Darcy from Northern Territory. Christabel leads the Program Evaluation Unit within the Northern Territory Department of Treasury and Finance and is co-convener of the Northern Territory branch of the Australian Evaluation Society. Christabel has a background in health research and has previously worked in science and innovation policy with the Commonwealth Government and economic policy within the Northern Territory Government. Welcome Christabel. And finally, um, Narina. Narina is Canberra based and she's a director in the policy design and evaluation team with a focus on how to embed evaluation into policy design. Narina brings a background in social policy in Commonwealth and ACT government settings. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we did have Kylie Dowling joining us, but unfortunately she's been able, unable to make it today. Um, but welcome to all of our panel members. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, um, in terms of today's session, we're going to start by hearing from each of the panelists on the frameworks and approaches that guide program evaluation in their settings. Um, we'll then be moving towards a panel discussion and we'll invite questions from all of you listening today in the audience as well. To start, I'd like to invite Danielle to share the New South Wales approach. Thank you, Melissa, and good afternoon to all. I'm dialing in today from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and would like to acknowledge your past, present, and emerging. I'm proud today to represent the Centre for Evidence and Evaluation within the Economic Strategy Division of the New South Wales Treasury. 
The unit has a central role in driving evidence-based decision-making across the New South Wales government. Next slide, thank you. So building evaluation across government, as you would all know, has a long history, and I'll only be representing a small part of this today. Greater impetus to build evidence and performance reporting was provided by a series of audit reports for the New South Wales government, which emphasised the need for evidence, efficiency, effectiveness and value for money in government decision making. Um, next slide, thanks. Part of the government response was to set up a Centre for Program Evaluation, which is now the New South Wales Treasury for New South Wales Treasury Centre for Evidence and Evaluation. The key role for the centre is to develop an evidence bank for decision making. And as part of that, we set the standards for agencies through a number of different guidelines. We work with agencies to build capacity to apply those standards consistently across the public sector. And we also provide review and assessment of CBAs and evaluations conducted by agencies. Next slide, thank you. So to improve standards of evidence, the Centre has provided a series of guidelines documents related both to ex ante or before implementation appraisal of initiatives and requirements related to post implementation or ex post evaluation of initiatives. Next slide. We are owners of the New South Wales Government Evaluation Guidelines that sits within this suite of documents. The guidelines are supported by a toolkit of resources that's available online and assists government agencies to implement the different stages of the New South Wales Government Program Evaluation Guidelines. So we are currently updating these program evaluation guidelines and supporting resources. This is in line with a general refresh of documents to ensure that they're aligned with current best practice, but particularly aligned with new developments in New South Wales government policies related to performance reporting and evidence. Next slide. So key to this is a role, the role of outcome budgeting, which has introduced state outcomes as clear statements of what the government is seeking to achieve for the New South Wales community. And outcome budgeting works with the investment phase guidelines to ensure that evidence supports uh, budget cycle decision-making and also enhances cluster capability in assessing initiatives. And here the whole of government approach is very important because it enables the government to make decisions across uh, initiatives proposed across government. And last slide. So one of our key activities then is in updating the guidelines as part of anticipating some of the challenges we've identified in linkages between the different processes. So in terms of business case guidance, it's very important that we recognise the role of evaluation and CBA in informing initiative development. And then as part of in initiative development, identifying <laughs> early the need for monitoring and evaluation planning, uh, both so that monitoring and evaluation planning can be resourced uh, so that data can be collected early and so that that awareness of what the initiative is intended to be achieving is maintained throughout its implementation. In turn, monitoring and evaluation informs that post-implementation appraisal, which feeds into decision-making regarding improving the initiative, but also provides a better evidence base for future appraisals going forward. All of this sits within the overall objectives of New South Wales government activity, which is identified through the New South Wales state outcomes, outcome budgeting processes, and noting that we also have an investor insurance policy framework, whereas activities of a high risk profile or and high priority and size will trigger 
independent peer assessment of their various stages of business case CBA benefits realisation and evaluation. Thank you. That's New South Wales. Thank you. Uh, so handing over to Queensland. Hi, can I just check you can hear me? We can hear you too. Melissa? Thank you. Great. Um, apologies for the lack of video, but some um, issues. Oh, I think, Todd, we may have some challenges actually. Yeah. Todd, you may have just dropped out actually. Thanks very much. Well, there had to be some technical challenges, didn't there? Um, perhaps what we'll do, Todd, uh, we might just move over and um, go to Eleanor in Victoria um, and we'll come back to Queensland when we have Todd back on the line. That's great. Happy to happy to jump in, and we can move back to Todd. And thank thanks for having having me here today. Um, I did want to. I'll just give the briefest kind of summary. And I think New South Wales. That's just such a great summary of um, what a highly functional kind of system is in place. If we move to the first slide, just in terms of Victoria's setup, Victoria probably works in a little bit less of a systematic way. I know this is quite a fun photo as opposed to the. Um, sort of formal slides. But what I want to emphasise, actually in Victoria, we don't have a central agency kind of evaluation function that guides the expectations across Victorian government, but we do have evaluation units in most of the departments. And the largest is um, in the Department of Health, and this is this is them last year at the Christmas party. Um, this means it sort of works in a bit of a more loosely federated model, and it's why we, um, in general in Victoria, they um, there's a Victorian public sector evaluation network and they work in a very network, networked way, sort of sharing materials and um, solutions across the public sector. But that's not to say there's not some central agency expectations that are in place. So we've moved to the next slide. Um, one of the guiding documents that's in place is um, the Department of Premier and Cabinet launched an evidence reform strategy. I think that was in 2019. Um, and broadly that sets the expectations in terms of evidence formed policy overall. And this is probably my favourite diagram from that document, which is sort of emphasising the fact that um, with products like government program evaluations, it's not only about ensuring the quality supply of them, it's also making sure there's demand at the other end. And a lot of these systems are designed to stimulate the demand to make sure that we are, you know, effectively requiring high quality program evaluation from decision makers. And that's what leads to that productive use in the middle. So as you said, there's also a quote at the bottom of that slide, which sort of emphasises this reform strategy is about harnessing evidence to support better decision making, which I think is what probably most people in this call um, are passionate about. Um, if we go to the next slide, there's also some requirements from Department of Treasury and Finance about um, that specifically uh, apply to lapsing programs. So the bulk of evaluation requirements in Victoria re relate to budget funding so at the point where um, a project is funded through the budget process, it's required to have an evaluation plan and it's need to have met that by the time the budget funding is lapsing. And it does, the requirements around lapsing program evaluation do set out some high level requirements of what, how program evaluation should work and what it needs to include. Um, if we move to the next slide, this is, I've just done a little excerpt from the resource management framework um, and I know this will be too small to probably read on screens um, but for people who get the slides later this is sort of the key section which outlines um, what the specific requirements are around those budget um, lapsing programs and so they're really asking um, for slightly different requirements slightly higher expectations where the total funding is 20 million or more um, and lower expectations where it's less than 20 million funding over that four-year period um, and so this is sort of all that sits in place in Victoria in terms of an absolute requirement around program evaluation, which means everything else happens as part of the broader network of activities and the, the sharing of good practice. I haven't brought in today, most of the departments do have um, good examples of those sort of evaluation guidelines and templates and tools in place, but there's not something sort of centrally mandated on that front. I think, do I have one more slide? 
Oh, yes. And I was just emphasising, um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, so there is this Victorian Public Sector Evaluation Network, and we're also closely connected to the Australian Public Sector Evaluation Network. Um, and that really operates to deliver um, this regular program of, of events and share good practice um, and provide that sort of forum there's a lot of questions get asked between that network. So say if somebody is looking to run a program evaluation and they want peer review or they want some um, input, that network sort of operates to provide that, that um, sharing of expertise and sharing of knowledge across departments. I think that's everything I was going to cover for Victoria. Thanks so much, Eleanor. That was great. Um, and love the photos too. Um, <laughs> we'll just move now... Todd, did you just, I'll just throw to Todd and see. Todd, are you on the line? Can you speak and we'll just see if your connection will hold? I think that's a no. Let's continue on. Christabel, we'd love to hear from you about the Northern Territory. Thank you. Uh, Rob, if we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm talking to you today from Darwin, which is on Larrakia land, and I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. Next slide, please. Uh, we've only recently set up our whole of government approach to evaluation in the Northern Territory. Our framework was released in May last year. Um, I'd like to explain why we felt that we needed a whole of government evaluation approach. In 2018, an interim report by the Fiscal Strategy Panel found that the Northern Territory government was in the unsustainable position of borrowing to pay for recurrent activities, including interest expenses. The 2019 final report had a range of recommendations to fix the budget, including improving government's approach to program evaluation. The report noted a whole of government approach to evaluation was required to embed a culture of evidence-based policy across the Territory Government. Government accepted all the evaluation related recommendations and the Department of Treasury and Finance is responsible for implementing them. Next slide, please. And luckily for us, we weren't starting from, from scratch. Uh, we borrowed a lot from other jurisdictions, uh, especially New South Wales, ACT, uh, WA, uh, and the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. We contacted our counterparts in other jurisdictions and we were delighted at how generous they were sharing the lessons that they had learned along the way. We also established uh, a Northern Territory Government Program Evaluation Community of Practice. And this group was very active, reviewing and commenting on drafts of the framework, toolkit and templates. Next slide, please. So we now have a team of three people and we sit within the budget development team. We report to the Senior Director of Budget Development and Evaluation within Treasury. Our role is to coordinate, support and encourage the use of evaluations across government. The responsibility for evaluation or commissioning evaluations sits with line agencies. Next slide, thanks. As our program evaluation framework was developed in the context of budget repair, we needed to integrate evaluation into the budget development process. And I'd like to finish by summarising uh, how we've been doing this. So the cabinet submission template now includes program evaluation and sunset clause requirements. We use evaluations to inform treasury comments on cabinet submissions. Uh, and this is um, important in terms of making sure that we're using the evidence base. Um, a whole of government program master list is developed each year as part of the budget development process, which links current programs to government priorities and strategies, previous evaluations and planned evaluations. A risk-based ranking process is used to prioritise evaluations. And this is important because we need to make sure that we're using our evaluation resources wisely. The annual schedule of evaluations is endorsed by the Budget Review Subcommittee of Cabinet each year, along with an update on previous evaluations to close the loop. And finally, um, a repository of completed evaluations uh, is building an evidence base of what works in the Territory. Next slide, thank you. Um, and if you'd like to know more, there's more information on our website. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christabel. That's fascinating, particularly the repository, and I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, Navrina, can I invite you to share from your perspective? Sure, thank you. 
Um, I'd first like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land from where I'm speaking to you today. I um, wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of Canberra and the region. Um, I'd like to start with the first slide by putting the um, ACT's evaluation policy in context. Um, some of the characteristics of the ACT as a small jurisdiction with only one level of government shapes our approach to evaluation policy. So for example, the ACT has a one service model, which places a strong emphasis on working collaboratively across directorates. Um, so this means for us, there's been more of an emphasis on collaboration capability and guidance rather than uh, formal mandated requirements for evaluation. Um, so we've had an evaluation policy since 2010. And during this time, our whole of government approach has evolved. So 10 years ago, when the evaluation policy was first launched, it was very much within the performance and accountability framework. So it was um, designed to improve um, performance and accountability. And the main requirement was for directorates to produce an annual evaluation plan. Um, and the role of the central agency was primarily one of coordinating um, that reporting process. In terms of our impetus for moving, taking more of a whole of government approach, um, I think what we found was while the process of developing agency plans had increased awareness of evaluation and there'd been some increased training in some agencies, that we needed to have a more of deliberate strategy to develop capability. Um, in our evaluation uh, policy, we have a maturity um, framework and I think it was recognised we needed to have a bit more of a whole of government approach in building that capability. Um, and I think the other driver was also an increasing recognition of the need to be able to evaluate priorities that impact across multiple portfolios. Um, so that's kind of the context of how we became established in 2019. Um, so we were established, uh, the policy design and evaluation team was established as a whole of government uh, function. It was funded in the 2018-19 budget. And it was set up to um, complement and support the directorate's own evaluation capabilities and their own um, evaluation work. So we don't have an oversight role or a compliance role. We're intended as a whole of government resource. And, and along those lines, our initial focus has been on capability building. Um, partly this is because we recognise that this is going to be a key building block if we're looking at how to take, um, undertake cross-government evaluations in the future. Um, I just want to briefly talk about the ACT Evidence and Evaluation Academy, um, because that's one of the key initiatives in our capability um, strategy, and I think it illustrates our whole of government approach. Um, it was launched in April this year, and it will run until August. Um, it's been designed and delivered um, for the ACT by Dr. George Argaris from UTS, um, with Dr. Duncan Rital from Rooftop Top Social. And, the, and it's the key features of the Academy uh, that it is needs-based and tailored to the ACT. So um, participants complete a needs assessment at the beginning and during the program. We also do an assessment of organisational culture from each directorate. Um, the other aspect of it is that it's aimed at embedding evaluation practice and building a cohort across the ACT um, public service. So in the past, we've trialled um, short courses um, and we wanted to get take the next step beyond individual learning to developing more of a whole of government approach. So participants bring a work pro a project to the academy and then they, the idea is that they transfer the skills and knowledge back to their team. So it's part of this ongoing um, building of evaluation practice. Um, and outside the workshop, there's been six workshops and outside of the workshops, participants meet in groups, which includes coaching and peer support. Um, and the, the peer support was a key part of the program. Um, so part of it has been providing participants with the tools to be effective um, peer supports. And partly this is because we have an expectation, expectation that this will be an ongoing cohort that continues to be engaged beyond the formal program. Uh, we see them having a key role in building evalua evaluation practice um, and doing that collaboratively. So ultimately we want them to be, uh, be a community of influencers. Um, the participants are also supported by evaluation executive champions at the SES level, um, and this recognises that um, we want capability to be more than individual sk skills development, and we want to develop that whole of government evaluation culture. Um, and then finally, I think it takes me on to the next point about the um, what distinguishes the ACT's approach to evaluation, and I think it's the ACT's wellbeing framework, which was launched last year. 
um, and the dashboard was released this year. So when we set up the academy, one of the key uh, aspects of it was that we wanted to apply a wellbeing lens. So we wanted participants to be able to have the confidence to evaluate policy and programs using a wellbeing lens. So the wellbeing framework um, provides that shared outcomes framework so that participants can start to make the connections across programs and start to think in a whole of government way about evaluation. Um, and this will become increasingly important as we move to the next phase of embedding wellbeing into policy um, and budget processes in the ACT. So the whole of government approach to evaluation will become a key part of that wellbeing uh, work as we go forward. So that's it for the ACT. Fantastic. Thanks, Marina. And really interested to talk a little bit more about the wellbeing framework as we go along too. Um, now, I think Todd may have rejoined us. Todd, did you just want to try and speak and we'll see if we can hear you this time? Okay. Can you hear me? We can. Um, so we'll just yeah. flick back to the Queensland slides. Technology. It's holding up for now. So thank you for rejoining us, Todd. All right. Thank you. you. And Hopefully you can continue to hear me as I speak. Um, yeah, so my name's Todd Sanzis and I work in the Queensland Government Statisticians Office in Treasury. Um, next slide. So just a brief orientation of the structure. So the Stats Office, um, the main role is to support uh, the evidence base for policy and decision making. Um, and this feeds into fairly well the um, supporting uh, the budget process, economic analysis, uh, policy development, performance reporting, uh, and investment um, decision making. Um, we've got a small team um, uh, in the evaluation and performance function within QGSO. Um, we provide advice to, to Treasury and other agencies and undertake evaluation and have oversight for the Queensland Government Program Evaluation Guidelines. Uh, next slide. Um, so just by way of uh, some context for the, the guidelines represent the main component to um, a whole of government approach, if you like. Um, they came about in 2014 um, following a, a Queensland Audit Office audit recommendation um, to clarify expectations on the evaluation of public sector programs. Um, we updated those, those guidelines in 2020 to simplify the language and support the application of contemporary evaluation practice within um, the context of government priorities. Uh, it was just, the previous edition was a, a fairly, ha, had a fairly heavy focus on uh, economic evaluation. We wanted to sort of broaden that to um, other um, social and other policy environments um, particularly. Uh, the guidelines aren't mandatory, but uh, they provide a good sort of common starting place for agencies looking for, for good practice guidelines. Um, next slide. Um, so, yeah, the main purpose of the, the guidelines are to support users to understand the evaluative concepts. Um, there's content there on sort of building uh, capabilities. So we've got um, quite a few information sheets, short information sheets on specific evaluation topics um, to complement the, the, the guidelines themselves. Um, a, a real theme on uh, embedding evaluative thinking early uh, and often throughout the policy cycle. Um, uh, evaluating, so actually how to undertake the evaluation of government funded programs and then again a focus on aligning expenditure to government priorities. Um, there's a range of um, uh, other complementary resources uh, including the uh, Financial Accountability Act, so there's a section there that requires uh, accountable officers to achieve uh, value for money um, by ensuring their operations are carried out efficiently, effectively and economically. So the guidelines help to support that function and accountability. Uh, performance management framework and then uh, the budget process. So cabinet decisions uh, particularly related to significant government strategies and programs um, 
have increasingly required an evaluation framework to be established with reporting on outcomes. Um, uh, next slide, might be the last one. Um, so that's just, um, yeah, where our resource, free, free resource is available um, and the information sheets, which we're sort of adding to as we go. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. So as I mentioned, we will have some questions from all of you on the floor as well. So feel free to pop those in the chat as we go to. Um, I'll start off though with a question to those of you on the panel who have whole of government evaluation approaches like that we've just heard about from Todd. What was the catalyst for establishing a whole of government approach and what are some of the strengths and weaknesses in your view and the challenges that you've faced in implementing it in practice? Christabel, did you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so I mentioned that our framework was developed in the context of the fiscal strategy panels report. Um, and at the time, it was simply up to individual agencies to evaluate programs. And the panel noted that there was an ad hoc approach to evaluation, and that the standard of evaluation was inconsistent across agencies. And so the idea was having a whole of government approach would try to bring some consistency uh, across government. And for those of you on the panel, what have you found is working well with your whole of government approaches for those of you who are using them? Todd, did you want to jump in with some of your experiences from Queensland? Yeah, and just to clarify one of the comments, we're not moving away from economic evaluation. We just want to um, uh, broaden the scope so that the principles that we've um, included can be applicable across a range of policy environments. So just to clarify that point, we're certainly not moving away from uh, economic evaluation. That's a key component to a lot of um, sort of um, high, high profile, high, high risk, high scale um, evaluations that we undertake. Take. And what's worked well for us? Yeah, I suppose providing a level of consistency from um, from a, you know, a starting point, getting good principles in place uh, across any evaluation, depending on the, uh, sorry, regardless of the size. Um, and so I think there's been, yeah, also an increasing acknowledgement of thinking about uh, evaluation at the outset. So at the program uh, design and uh, conception phase, so not just as an afterthought, but, um, but early in that those discussions. So that's probably worked fairly well from a, a whole government perspective. And Narina, I'm interested in your thoughts too, based on your experience. What's worked well in your framework and how have you found the uptake? Particularly, I'm interested in the wellbeing approach that you've integrated. Um, what challenges have you faced in practice in having that uptake be embraced by the community generally? Yeah, so um, in terms of some of the challenges, I think when we were established as a policy design and evaluation team, I think there was um, probably an assumption that we would do some more of the, so we also have a hands-on role in terms of evaluation and that we would do some more of those strategic um, whole of government evaluations and priorities. I think one of the lessons for us was that's probably a later maturity and that there was some investment in capability um, building, but also in building networks and practice um, before, before you can sort of get into that stage. Um, we're still very much in the early days of um, the wellbeing work in terms of how that gets embedded into the policy and practice. But I think what we're seeing is a real um, interest in being able to link what people are doing in terms of their programs and activities. So the domains are quite high level um, in terms of the indicators, but there's quite a bit of work now um, happening to within areas to understand what the linkages are and what the pathways are, and then what that might mean in terms of the future evidence and the ways that they can design um, to capture that wellbeing evidence, and, as well as looking at how they might evaluate that contribution towards outcomes. So I think it's still fairly early, but I think there's a real willingness um, to embrace the wellbeing framework in terms of those shared outcomes. Yeah, that's really exciting, Narina. Um, and Eleanor, for you, what have you found is working really well in Victoria and where have been some of the challenges that you've been navigating? Yes, yeah, so I think um, 
I think we've we've had that long established kind of approach around lapsing program evaluations, which means that's a really well established part of um, the budgeting process. And I think a lot of times when people talk about good evaluation systems, partly it's about how integrated it is into the decision making, you know, how much it is part of the um, fabric of the process. Uh, I think what we're seeing is uh, like really good practice happening at the individual organisation level, but perhaps not um, you know, I can I can really see the benefits where you do have those more systematic um, structures in place. On the other hand, I guess what you see is um, different departments finding systems that work for them in, in their particular context with their particular content. You know, we're talking about that trade-off between economic evaluations and other kinds that works differently in different policy portfolios. So there is some benefit to diversity, but equally, I can see there's a lot of attraction in trying to set up a good whole of government um, process as well. There's a very interesting question that's just come through on the chat around the evidence base for whole of government evaluation frameworks. And I think it's an interesting one for all of us as evaluators, as we think about evidence all the time as we're informing practice, but for our own practice. To the panel, um, and maybe Danielle, I'm interested in your thoughts to start, the evidence base behind having a whole of government approach What's your view on that um, and what have you learned from the New South Wales experience from the evaluation approaches that you've undertaken here? Okay, so I think that ties into the earlier conversation too. And um, as Christabel raised and as was followed by many, um, it's quite important to have that consistency in approach because the government is making decisions across a range of very different but also very important projects and having a consistency in approach to evidence enables that larger scale decision making. Uh, within New South Wales government, all of our clusters have some um, uh, a significant degree of evaluation expertise, although the um, evaluation cluster looks uh, different um, within each cluster. The whole of government approach provides that overarching framework, recognising that clusters do have their own expertise. And certainly where clusters are developing that maturity, we can provide greater guidance, um, whereas other clusters may be better developed there. Um, so I did just want to, there is a, a point in the chat and we, it was just raised on the economic evaluation and I would like to point out that, um, you know, one of the key things from the audit reports was the importance of recognising efficiency and value for money and transparency there. Um, the New South Wales Guide to CBA emphasises the importance of net social benefits. So it's not, we don't think of it as an economic evaluation approach narrowly. So the guidance on CBA is about recognising the breadth and extent of impacts, both qualitatively and quantitatively identified and using as a final assessment um, uh, benefit cost ratios to assist in identifying what that net social benefit may look like. Uh, but certainly we see it as quite a broad social benefit assessment tool. And yes, being that it does provide for that uh, consistency in approach to evidence across a range of uh, different activities because the benefits it picks up can be social, economic, environmental, or cultural. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and to the panel more broadly, the evidence base behind your decision-making in um, adapting or not all of government approach, I'm really interested to hear from you. You know, what, what do you see as some of the strengths of the approach and what do you see as some of the weaknesses and ways to look at strengthening it over time? Um, if, I, if I can jump in, um, Mel, um, I noticed that the Thodi review of the APS uh, had a big section on evaluation and what evaluation looks like um, in the future of government. Um, and they spent quite a bit of time going through the evidence of the different approaches to evaluation in government, uh, where you can have um, a centralised uh, evaluation approach where you have a central agency that not only sets up the guidelines but also does the evaluation. So where you've got a central agency coming in and evaluating. Um, 
D programs in other agencies. And then you've got the other end of the spectrum where agencies are all taking different approaches to evaluations. Um, and they suggested that the best way forward was what they called a hub and spoke model, where you've got a hub in the central agency which coordinates evaluation, but takes a step back and leaves the actual commissioning of the evaluations or evaluations to the agencies, which allows them to be to bring in their subject matter expertise. Um, and they suggested that way forward. So for people who are interested, there's um, quite a bit of detail in that report. Yeah, that's really interesting, Christopher. Um, other men members of the panel? I do have a question if um, people don't want to jump in, um, which is related to a number of the questions that have come through as well. It's around um, thinking about evaluation frameworks and the way that they shape and guide our thinking as evaluators. Um, how do your frameworks, in your view, foster emerging trends in best practice in evaluation? So for instance, those that have been articulated in the Productivity Commission's review, um, the Indigenous Evaluation Strategy. Um, things like a collaborative design, empowerment principles, elevation of lived experience voices. I'm really interested to hear from those of you on the panel um, how you've integrated some of that. And I think, Narina, your um, wellbeing example may be one of these that we could start with. Um, but how you've integrated some of those emerging views on best practice to ensure that we as an evaluation community are not um, stagnating in the methods that we are using and applying in practice. Um, so I might start there. I think with our policy, which is obviously a 2010 uh, one, which we will be updating in the context of the wellbeing policy, and I think we'll be picking up on some of the, um, the key themes around that. Certainly in terms of that one of lived experience, I think that's um, quite a key focus in a lot of policy areas as well, and I think that we'll have a stronger focus in a, re a fresh evaluation policy. And it was certainly in terms, there was an extensive consultation process in terms of the wellbeing framework. So in terms of how the indicators and the measures were um, identified, it was about an extensive engagement process with um, ACT community about what was important and what did wellbeing mean from them. So um, that process actually re uh, reflects quite an extensive process, including people who may not normally participate government community engagement so the wellbeing team actually made um, there was a lot of work going to sort of reach out to um, different voices as part of that process what about Eleanor from your setting Do you want to, could you just repeat their question Melissa just so I'm staying on task I was very taken by what Noreen was saying <laughs> thinking about your um, framework and approach how does it support the novel sort of approaches to evaluation or, um, you know, best practice approaches to evaluation that are emerging over time. I gave the, um, the example of the IES um, framework produced by the Productivity Commission, but more broadly, like thinking about methodologies, like empowerment methodologies, lived experience voices. Um, how, do yeah. you, how do you integrate that into a model and ensure that it's responsive and able to really encompass some of those novel methodologies? You know, I think so in Victoria where we've got a looser whole of government strategy. So actually if you look at the um, evidence reform strategy, that's actually very big into valuing different kinds of evidence. A lot of what it's saying is that we probably need to move, we need to stop thinking about hierarchies of evidence and, and recognising um, that different forms of evidence are appropriate in different situations. And that's actually a pretty big disruption where you've also got treasury guidelines that more say we'd expect pretty rigorous um, uh, analysis of causation when we're talking about big investments. So there's two things, there's that tension of those things pulling against each other. But I guess because neither of them are especially prescriptive, it actually still leaves the door open for departments to make decisions on their own. And I do think um, at this stage, it's sort of emerging a bit more organically through the Victorian Public Service about which way they go around those concepts of method and how prescriptive it is. So each department has their own sort of set of guidelines. Um, and broadly, they all say that evaluation methods need to be fit for purpose. There's a lot of content around client voice and there's a lot of content about um, Indigenous led approaches as well. So making sure that, that, um, that that's all fit for purpose. Uh, so I think there is, there, there's pros and cons of having a loose model, which does allow for that innovation and tailoring. Um, but yeah, obviously the con is in terms around consistency. We've had questions about, you know, sort of how do you compare apples and oranges and do you cost things like social impacts um, 
they they're all very very big questions that uh, you know I think are open for debate um, in Victoria with the system we're under. But you know the more that you get prescriptive, and the more you try and ta- nail a whole of government approach, the more you have to make it make decisions on those things. You have to make it call one way or the other mm-hmm. around whether you accept innovation or if you think it's going to create too much inconsistency. Good point, Eleanor. And um, Todd, I guess this sort of goes Mm. to your point earlier as well around, you know, balancing different methodologies and different elements of evaluation. Um, And I'm interested in your perspective in Queensland. Yeah, I mean, I'd second the point that um, um, the design, the methods, the approaches should be fit for purpose and um, are somewhat dependent on available resources and time and relationships and do we have um, uh, sufficient time to allow the the right kind of relationships to occur with communities to um, sort of let them um, sort of lead some of the evaluations and design approaches. So there's a lot of, one of our information sheets touches on kind of the branches of evidence, uh, research evidence, contextual evidence, experiential evidence and financial evidence are just a few that we tap into where we recognise that um, uh, there are different types of evidence that that are fit for purpose and uh, appropriate. Just one other point I'd make is um, in terms of how we keep up with uh, abreast of um, contemporary practice we stay looped into AES um, content, um, uh, better evaluation, various sources that we, we stay connected with um, and across different networks. Um, so, yeah, we're always learning. I think the, the field of... We may have just lost you again, Todd, <laughs> but I think we got the gist. The evaluation is a, a learning um, field and profession, if you like, um, Thank you. Yeah, we've got you back back now, Todd. Yes, thank you. Um, Great answer. And Christabel, there's a question here that I'm going to throw to you first and then to the rest of the panel, which is similar um, sort of question, but around whether whole of government approaches actually help achieve value for government money in your perspective. Um, And does the evidence consistently change expenditure decisions? So I'm interested in your thoughts, given that fairly recently you determined that you wanted to go through a whole of government method. Look, it's still really early days for us. Um, Our framework was only released uh, last year. Um, We'll certainly be reviewing our approach over time, Um, but I do think there is the potential for it to improve value for money over time. I think uh, one of the real Um, important points of the whole of government approach is the coordination that we can bring. Um, So now, as I mentioned, part of our uh, budget process, we now ask agencies to complete the program master list. Um, And for us, that is the first time that we have had a whole of government list of all of our programs, how they link to government priorities, um, and an indication of what the evidence base that sits behind each of those programs, whether they have ever been evaluated before. So um, that is really useful. Um, And also as part of that, we ask agencies to indicate when they're planning to evaluate. And that can be really important for where programs have a shared outcome. We can start to encourage agencies to think about where it makes sense to coordinate evaluation. So you haven't got siloed evaluations happening where you haven't, we're not going out to communities um, and asking the same questions and collecting data independently where it makes sense to evaluate programs together. So I think there is potential, but it's something that we'll have to review over time. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting, actually, that idea about um, linking the evaluations so that you're not oversampling. Really important point and something to consider. Um, There is a question that's specific to you and particularly that risk-based ranking that you've mentioned. Um, Claire has asked if you could explain a little bit more about the uptake and influence of um, the evaluation unit. Um, and how you influence the number of um, the quality of evaluations and the number of evaluations. So you've described a bit about how you prioritise there. Yeah, look, the risk-based approach that we use um, is adapted from the New South Wales approach and their their tiering. Um, And in our initial discussions uh, with agencies, it was interesting, I think, um, the the starting point for prioritising uh, evaluations was 
simply the funding size of the program, so how much funding um, the program had was used as the main driver for how important it was to evaluate it. Um, and while that is definitely a component, it's not the only thing that should be taken into account. And so um, getting people to think more broadly about what the risk actually looks like. Um, one important one is, you know, risk to government and community, uh, how, much, uh, how much it aligns to uh, government priorities and what the evidence base is. So if, if something is a really new approach, if, if we're trialling something innovative, even if it has a relatively small budget, it probably is something that should be uh, prioritised for evaluation. Um, mm. And then in terms of the, the second part of the question, how much influence we've had, it's still really early days. Um, I think it's been really important for us to, to bring together the people who were already involved in evaluation um, across the Northern Territory Government. Um, you know, our community of practice now has um, over 100 people across all agencies um, and, and finding ways for them to share information with each other, share lessons learned with each other, um, I think will help over time uh, to improve the quality of evaluations, but still early days. Yeah, absolutely, Christabel. And I guess given that you did borrow some of those ideas from New South Wales, Danielle, I'm interested to hear from you how the tier system is working in New uh, South Wales. I would very much like to also weigh in on the earlier discussion about the whole of government approaches. Please do. <laughs> and its effectiveness. Um, from our perspective, it's not a top-down process. So our work in building an evidence bank and in um, updating, say, the evaluation guidance is very much a collaborative process. So just as important is all those conversations that are happening across clusters about what's feasible, uh, what's best practice, um, what we want to prioritise in terms of requirements and getting an understanding across different clusters of where our skills are and how we approach things and, yeah, just what the business models look like. So in that sense, as I'm emphasising, the whole of government approach is collaborative and that's part of its value um, or I guess the, the key aspect of its value in that we're developing this and learning together. So that's on that point. In terms of the tiering and risk-based, um, as with, um, we've recognised uh, with many of us, you know, evaluation and performance reporting is building in maturity. We're not at a stage where the entire portfolio is, of activities is being evaluated on uh, the regular basis that we may be aiming for. Uh, certainly, there's a need to identify where we're going to prioritise evaluations and the gateway process is an effective way of saying uh, these are particularly high profile or high risk projects. We need to ensure an independent uh, review of those uh, appraisals and evaluations related to this initiative. However, the framework itself doesn't determine what should be evaluated and when. So that's an internal uh, agency decision often made in communication with Treasury. And certainly there's a value in a consistent evaluation schedule that uh, considers performance across your initiatives, uh, when budget decisions are being made, when information is needed to inform uh, decision-making, whether it's just investment or reframing an initiative. And also that there's a lot of value in evaluating smaller programs when there's potentials to demonstrate lessons learned or best practice uh, across an area, um, or that you know, just the, the learnings from that can be applied elsewhere. So the, the tiering is important to ensure that those are big, important um, initiatives are well monitored, but certainly evaluation uh, provides a, an important role across an entire portfolio of initiatives. And Danielle, you've touched on a point there that um, I guess I wanted to explore a little bit more around independence more broadly. And I'm interested in, um, and Christabel, you spoke about this earlier too, around um, thinking about the internal conduct of evaluation, um, the balance that you are all driving within your individual frameworks in independent evaluation work versus 
um, internal program-led evaluation or perhaps um, independent government-led evaluation. So I wondered if each of you wanted to talk a little bit about the way that your frameworks drive or support consideration around which evaluations are conducted externally and which you commission versus those that you keep in-house. Um, Eleanor, did you want to go first there? Well, this in general is one of my favourite topics, which is about, you know, what's the, that sort of the ethics and appropriateness of internal versus external evaluation, um, ha having led an external evaluation unit for a, a long period. Um, oh, so the, the frameworks in Victoria really don't specify, except for the fact that for lapsing program evaluations, you can't have somebody who designed the program evaluating the program. That's the, that's the full extent of the limits in Victoria, which really leaves the door open for someone even just next door of a program to, to be able to evaluate. And I actually think that's fine because there's as long as the method and the approach is appropriate and it's been validated and you're, you're basing it, it's well designed and well executed, it, it doesn't matter so much who does it. And I think um, obviously there's a, there's a school of thought that says internal evaluation units inside departments aren't appropriate because you're evaluating yourself. Um, my position is obviously I disagree with that. I think that you can put all the appropriate um, checks and balances in place and actually the commercial relationship when you have when you have to externally procure one effectively creates the same conflict so we have to kind of at some point just trust that if these things are set up right and executed well there's no reason that um the per the you know the entity delivering it has to play such a critical part um but i do think you know i think it can be helpful to have frameworks which say how close or how far away you need to be in order to evaluate but I don't think that's a, a, a really core question about the quality of what, what you're going to get delivered is about whether how, how close it is to the program itself. It's really about how the thing's conducted. Um, Todd, if you're there, in your view from Queensland, um, what sort of emphasis do you put on those external evaluation versus internal evaluation activities, if any guidance in your framework itself? Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can. We can. Yeah, fairly similar. Um, we don't uh, we don't have that kind of tiered uh, risk based sort of approach um, either. Sometimes there may be a cabinet decision um, that requires an, um, uh, external evaluation. Often it does relate to the risk or scale or uh, resource intensiveness as well, um, or sort of profile. Um, but yeah, there's we we don't have. Um, you know, a massive breadth of evaluation and research functions across the departments in general. Um, there are some small scale evaluations that occur in house, but um, and where the capability of building can um, support that kind of in house approach, leveraging off the the guidelines, then then that that's okay too. So yeah, it kind of comes often down to that that risk profile and and um uh, capacity within the agency to to deliver but yeah um and Narina, from your perspective um so we've had a focus on um building internal uh capability and in that con it's it's an interesting question because i think people often ask this question about independence and we we probably have a few examples of hybrid models where um, supporting internal areas to do it, but there may be a data assurance process or there may be an economic analysis that's done externally. So um, I think we, you know, encourage it when we're working with um, different parts of the public service and they raise this question, we, you know, I guess we encourage the full gamut, which includes looking at some of the hybrid models. So there are advantages, I think, sometimes in doing it internally in terms of how that leads to continuous improvement in the program. Um, but you also want to have some of those assurance processes. So um, we have done a couple of examples of that hybrid model um, and, you know, recommending things like peer review or whether there's components that can be done independently and also how you set up, set up your reference groups um, and whether, you know, what sort of um, degree of external representation you have on those. So well, I guess it's an open question, but we sort of also encourage um, people to think about that hybrid model as well. And I think that's, um, you touched on a couple of other points that I wanted to delve into, both the governance arrangements, and so we might go there first. I'm really interested in, because I guess when we think about evaluation governance, having um, 
those stakeholders who have either lived experience or who are close to programs and service delivery as well is really important to help shape and guide evaluation approaches. Um, I'm interested in whether of any of your frameworks actually encompass that sort of direction around governance. Um, might go, Danielle, did you want to speak first from New South Wales? Uh, yes, so certainly our 2016 guidelines have um, advice on governance and also when it's appropriate to uh, perhaps bring in an external consultant and where activities can be undertaken internally. Um, I think these the questions overlap because uh, regardless, you need an appropriate governance structure that is um, drawing upon um, the internal requirements for the evaluation so you can be clear in terms of who the audience is, how the information is going to be used, uh, who should be feeding into the process. Um, and I think too that relates again to the question of use of internal and external resources. So whilst external resources can be brought in at various points, uh, perhaps for assurance, but often more because of immediate resourcing issues or particular expertise that is needed. You never move away from the importance of internal evaluative thinking. And it's very difficult to bring in uh, an external consultant late in the piece if that evaluative thinking hasn't been set up at the beginning of the initiative um, and if monitoring isn't in place. So I think we've always got to be careful uh, about um, suggesting that evaluation is something that can be outsourced and that someone can come in late in the piece and uh, just pick it up. So from that sense, the governance is very important at the beginning of the project, thinking about, okay, we're implementing it, who's going to be responsible for establishing the monitoring and who's going to be responsible for ensuring that the evaluation is scheduled at appropriate basis for decision making. And it's a very good point, Danielle, I guess. Um, for me as an evaluator, it's always the most exciting point to be brought in is at the start when a program is being established. And I have seen, I guess, um, sitting externally to government um, and watching tenders come out, we have seen that there's a transition to bringing in evaluators early, which is really exciting to see. Um, but I'm interested in how much of your frameworks drive that too. And Christabel, maybe from your perspective in establishing your framework, was that something that you were conscious of, really promoting this evaluation early and partnership early? Um, yeah, planning for evaluation early is, is really important um, as part of our framework. Um, and the, the internal external discussion um, is interesting. We haven't got any hard and fast rules. Um, it, it simply depends on the context. There's, you know, there's pros and cons to both sides. We like the idea of certainly um, evaluation planning agencies being really involved in that. They might have external help as part of that, but I don't think we should ever think that we can outsource the entire evaluation planning. Um, that really should be part of the policy design process. Um, and we, we also like the idea of agencies being involved in some of the simpler, smaller evaluations, especially process implementation, process evaluations where we're simply looking at, at how um, a program was, was implemented um, with the idea of that building capability over time. Um, there's always going to be a need for independent evaluations, um, not, not not because we can't always get the method right. I think we can do um, good evaluations internally, but sometimes we also need that, that perception of independence as well. Um, and I think that's an important one. Um, for us in terms of the governance, we have an evaluation work plan template, which we ask agencies to fill out um, within six months of their program being approved. Um, and that steps them through uh, who will be part of the steering committee, uh, when the evaluations will happen and what sort of methods that they will use. Um, and that's something that we review here at Treasury. Um, and so there can be, that's the um, discussion point for us in terms of whether they've got the methods right, whether they've got the right people involved. Mm, yeah, great. And um, Eleanor, in the Victorian perspective, one of the other things I guess I'm interested in more broadly, and we've touched on it a couple of times, is that capacity building. And I'm interested in, from your perspective, how you've integrated capacity building for evaluation 
into your model and into the work and driving that capacity across agencies? Well, it's such a good question. So in Victoria, it's still happening agency by agency. So Department of Health runs a pretty big um, program of capacity building across kind of evaluation 101 and literature reviews and program logic and data visualisation. So it's got a kind of a program of capacity building activities and they have been offered out to the VPS Evaluation Network to participate, but broadly it's actually targeted towards the one, you know, it's a big, big department and now two departments, Department of Health and Department of Fairness, Families and Families, Fairness and Housing, um, which used to be DHHS in Victoria. So there isn't a sort of whole of government approach, but the work that comes out of the, the big team in Department of Health is sort of um, spreading back out. I, I think there's clearly some very cool work happening um, in the ACT, I guess around that Leadership Academy um, approach as well. So I feel like other other um, jurisdictions have probably taken a more, more cross-government approach on that one. So we might throw then to Narina. Did you want to talk a little bit about the ACT model? And I think you can probably um, size is a factor um, and our city state is a factor in yep. terms of why a whole government approach to capability makes sense for us. Um, I guess we learned from some when we just sort of did tailor training, um, but we sort of really want to build that. I think when people participated in early training, I think one of the things they really enjoyed was that um, making connections across different areas um, and with peers in other directorates. So it's um, that's been a big part of the academy um, approach and I think we're really keen to sort of not just make it the uh, five months of the program but also how do we continue to build on this um, as a cohort and then continue to build on it so it has a bit of an um, accelerating um, impact and so we start I think we'll start to learn some lessons around how we do some of the selection for the academy um, so we did it on individual work pro, um, programs, but I think we might start looking more at how do we make it a bit more teams based, and that's some of that sustainability. Um, you know, how do you address things with um, uh, individuals moving on or changing, and how do you start to embed it into more into the organisational structure? So I think that will be some of the issues that we'll be thinking about going forward. But it certainly works for us as a model, and I think that's partly size, but also feedback from participants about that's where they get a lot of the value out of it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, panel members, did anyone else have comments that they wanted to make? Yep, Christabel's got her hand up. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say with the capability building for us in the Northern Territory, one of our challenges has been our remoteness. Um, and so capability building uh, was often something that involved flying someone up to have a workshop um, in Darwin, for example. Um, and in that context, uh, the online training has been really valuable, um, especially the online workshops that we've had through the Australian Evaluation Society, for example. So being able to share those opportunities, um, it meant that suddenly um, workshops were available much more frequently than they have been uh, for us in the Northern Territory previously. So that has been really useful. Um, and also, I guess I just wanted to say you know, there's lots of different ways of building capabilities so there's the formal stuff but I love the informal stuff um, you know sharing lessons learned I think is a great way of building capability and that's something that we're trying to do through our community of practice as well. Yeah and you know it's a really um, interesting point that you've sort of touched on there more broadly around the impact of COVID and um, which we've spoken about and I know um, we've held some previous panel discussions with some of you on the panel here um, around the impact on evaluation more generally. Um, but it has enabled us all as evaluation um, society more broadly to connect um, and to share learnings. So there have been those benefits too. Um, Danielle, I'm interested in your perspectives on building capacity in New South Wales, given that you're a fairly large area. Uh, yes. So as I uh, pointed out previously, we approach this as a collaborative process. So I think it works both ways. Um, we work with agencies and they're sort of identifying uh, their best practices and their challenges. And we can also share those um, with them through our collaborative groups. I did want to point out um, in relation to some of the earlier discussion that say uh, 
with um, New South Wales Aboriginal Affairs and the OCA plan, you know, those ongoing developments feed into what we do say, as also say the work of Department of Customer Service and Services in terms of recognising customers and stakeholders. Um, in terms of more general capability building, there is a number of community communities of practices um, that clusters run themselves and we have um, we had the opportunity to sit in on. Um, when we develop the or finalise the evaluation guidelines, we will then also take that out uh, to the clusters and utilise those communities of practice uh, to help um, run sessions on the new guidelines and how they're applied. I think to uh, New South Wales, it's got a, a number of cities and a lot of populations in regional locations. So now uh, some agencies are catching up with others who have already had good use of technology in place. Um, so, you know, Department of Regional New South Wales um, to connect uh, different groups. Um, so yes, some of them are already well established um, in coping with this online communications. But yeah. certainly it's provided uh, new forums. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to open quickly to the floor. Were there any other questions from the floor? Anyone want to come off mute and ask something? It's been such a fascinating conversation, everyone. Thank you so much for your participation.